Thank you, thank you. So can I get a clicker, please? Okay, so I got uh, some big shoes to follow. Getting a little echo here. Can you guys hear me? It's echoing a little bit. But okay, it's gonna have a lot, a lot of information. Can we get to the first slide? Sorry. Can we start all the way at the top, please? Okay. So a lot, a lot of information. I'm gonna go through this very quick. It's kind of echoing a lot, a little bit. Um, not gonna be able to go through all of this. This is actually a two-day course that I go through. Um, so we're gonna go as much as we can. So you guys are actually gonna get a lot, a lot of information in about an hour. Okay. So first, I just added this case back in. I took this out because we had to. I'm taking a two-day course and trying to do it in one hour, but I added this case after Dr. Hornbrook. Um, I disagreed with him. He was saying that, uh, I'll just be honest, he's saying sometimes if there's no bone, you gotta, you gotta do a bridge. Well, actually, I, this patient didn't want a bridge. A couple of um, doctors said, let's do a 22 to 27 bridge because there's no bone. You can see the teeth are splinted because they're very mobile, like grade two, grade three mobility, um, perial involved. So, you know, most people say, take it out. But the patient says, I don't want a bridge. So he got referred to me. Um, this was kind of what he did, prep and pray. You can see he's a little open bite. There, that's, that's a before and the after. So it's not perfect, but we're, I'm gonna show you how to make this a lot better through our digital workflow. So first CBC slice, you can't really see it with these projectors. It's about three millimeters and four millimeters on the ridge. You're also going to see, um, this was my first CBCT. It was a Gino Ray, Gino Ray, but now I have a Prexion with Stefan in the back there. You're gonna see a lot better image. You can see the ridge there. It's gonna be hard to hard to place implants there, especially a bridge with three to four millimeters. So what do we do? You can do a, um, you can do a bridge, a traditional bridge on crowns, but like I said, the patient didn't want that. Yeah. Um, the, the, Thank you, I was having a hard time too, that's what. I think the projectors, is that getting any better? Yeah. A lot better? Probably turn off this one too. Or y'all look at one. Okay. Um, this is one of my first cases a long time ago. I, I can improve a lot of things on this case, um, but I placed the implants. You see the perforations in the bone. Um, did the ridge augmentation closure. When you do a ridge augmentation, it's gonna be um, the biggest thing. So get closure. You can see I prepped the 22 and 27 just for a um, temporary, temporary prosthetic. Let the patient heal for six months. There's the PAs of the anteriors. And we did a fully digital work, workflow. Waited about six months for that to heal, put on true abutment scan bodies. And what I'm showing is why I added this case is that um, it's true that um, Dr. Hornbrook was doing a digital smile design, I'm gonna show that next, but this is a fully digital process and I've been doing this since 2017 is when I got my first um, three-shaped scanner. Is that a lot better? Would you guys rather see, see all that? Okay, thanks for that recommendation. So this is the after effect. So you, yes, you're gonna need to um, do some ridge augmentation. If you can't do it, I think what we were saying is that, you know, we can't do any harm, or at least the patient should be informed that we can, are able to place a 23 and 26 unit bridge. But like um, Dr. Hornbrook said that he doesn't do surgery, but he has a um, surgeon in there. And I'm just showing this case that, you know, I'm just a dentist like everybody else. Sometimes we disagree, because he said that if there's no bone, some cases should be bridges. Well. We can see the, you guys can see that we got about 10 millimeters. Now we went from three millimeters to about 10 millimeters. So even if there's no bone, we can show that you can ridge augmentation and place some implants there. And especially you can see, you can visit Stefan afterwards that um, all my offices have Prexion CBCTs now. So the image quality is a lot, lot better. Very, very clear. Don't you have one now, Nathan? Yes. It's awesome. Okay, so before and after. You guys aren't gonna be able to see this, but my lab bill on this case was $5,000, $4,972. At this time that I did this case, I was already milling in-house. Um, like Roshan said, that 
you know, you got to work with an end in mind. And I was already milling in house, but we're doing posterior units. Um, why was I milling in house? Is because I'm back up a little bit. So I, I got out of school in 2015. So still relatively new. And then I got out of residency. I did UT Houston AGD, and I got out in 2016. But we only did like five implants in residency. And during residency, I talked to my buddy. He says, man, I just did four arches today. And I was like, what? Four fixed hybrid arches. So he said he produced $100,000 that day. So for me, if somebody tells me that, and Roshan saying he's got 50 houses, I'm like, if he can do it, I can do it. So then I signed up for an all on four course. Three weeks after residency, I took an, a week long all on four, four course here in Dallas. Um, so I took that course and I've just been placing implants ever since and just taking a lot, a lot of CE. Why do I bring that up is because we know now the lab fee for a full arch zirconia is about six or seven thousand dollars. And this is what my digital course teaches how to mill in house and do all this workflows. But then I can mill it in house for a fraction of that, maybe fifteen hundred dollars, my whole case with all the implants. So I was just working myself backwards. I had a mill at this time. But of course, an anterior case for an aesthetic case, I was still sending out to the lab. Um, now I do have an in house ceramist, and it brings the cost down. I do a few cases a month and makes, makes up for it. Even if I do one case a month, it'll cover the salary. Um, but you gotta ask yourself, do you have the, to provide an ROI? So I know that um, we were talking about, you don't wanna have a shiny object syndrome, but everything that I did, I always worked my um, way backwards. Can I pay for it? Am I gonna provide a service that's gonna pay for it? I'm not just gonna buy things just to buy it. And I added this video in also. So answer your case, I'm a lot more, um, I'll let the video play. So this is actually, I do these cases um, because I use the amnion chorion membrane, which, which the bio excludes, so it gives some growth factors in there. Um, but you're gonna have a big defect in the front, and then you might be asking, why would you do um, implant placement bone drops all at once? Because you're taking a little gamble. The little gamble is that anytime you flap open in the anterior, you're gonna get a little bit of recession. So if you have a good protocol and good closure, um, now that case I'm about to restore it already, it looks beautiful, the papillas are there, but m the more times you flap it open, um, you're gonna get a little bit of recession, sometimes you'll create those black triangles. I wouldn't recommend that for your first few cases, um, but the bio-exclude helps out a lot for these cases. It just gives me more confidence. You can use PRF also, but if you're not, you can't get a good blood stick, you're in a little bit of trouble. Okay, so now going to the whole digital workflow. So we, we know there's CAD CAM, so it's basically CAD, the first part of it is computer aid design, and then a slash is computer aid manufacturing. Um, so the first part of that is talking about the data acquisition. When we're talking about data, you can take a intraoral scan or a PVS impression, and I'll show the workflow. You're gonna still be in a digital design workflow. Hornbrook was showing that he, you saw um, PVS models on there, and they were sectioning in that. You can do that once you get the data acquisition, then you're gonna to go to computer, um, computer aided manufacturing where you can either 3D print or mill it or manufacture it. So the whole workflow, um, Sonia was saying there's gonna be a, you need everything step by step and that's what this whole course is gonna talk about, getting down to the workflow. Okay, so the bottom here, you're gonna see that on the t if you take the top route for the data acquisition, you go intraoral scanner and then you can go to plan, 3D print or mill it um, after the design. The bottom part, you're gonna have a lab scanner, and you're still, that's how you're gonna get back into the digital workflow. So as you guys um, probably know, all zirconia is digitally designed and milled. It's because that's the, that's the um, material science of it. It's milled as a block, and it has a powder, and then it goes into a sintering oven. So there's no custom abutments or anything like that. Nobody's like pressing custom abutments. Everything's designed. So it's true that you're in a digital workflow, but it's a hybrid, and you gotta ask yourself, Am I gonna be able to pay for a digital scanner? Well, you can if you're, gonna, if you're gonna use it. I'll tell you the downside is that an iTero scanner's got a high, high monthly, um, monthly subscription fee. Costs about 360 for the first unit and then they'll charge you $100.80 for the second unit. So the more units you get, so that's a high cost. You gotta say like a PVS impression, they said it's $25. Are you gonna do enough units to pay for that? So all these things are going on in my head, but let's go back, it's 2021. I'm still using the same exact Trio scanner um, from 2017, I've done a lot, a lot of cases. All my full arch cases, ooh, when we used to do, um, I used to, when I first started, I, I had a, um, we didn't have an iTero, so I was taking full arch 
you know, the, the putty and then the, um, the previous impression. You do a couple of those, send it in Invisalign, they sell it's bad. Come back, do another one, and then you get tired of that and then you start building up volume. And then now, honestly, all my um, offices that I start up, I just start with the digital scanner. But when you first start, um, you have that fear, well, I did at least, am I gonna be able to pay for this? And I was, honestly, I was a lot cheaper now than when I first started. And I was telling a new grad that, that the biggest difference is gonna be uh, the communication. So now I'm confident in communication, so we do a lot of big cases. I'm just, honestly, I'd, I do about 10 fixed full arches a month. My goal is to get to 25. Like I said, I was, you know, I've got the end in mind, increase marketing, increase our sales process that we've been talking about, and you need a whole team um, to get there. So now I'm confident that if we do anything in a new office and we expand, I'm starting all digital because we have the work uh, flows down. So I'm gonna address this right here that I've been talking about. I didn't start off with the lab mill. When I first started, um, I built my startup with a spot for a mill in the corner. I didn't know anything, anything about milling, but I worked myself backwards. Literally didn't know anything, but I said, if I'm gonna take these courses and I'm gonna do this, I have a spot for there, and then I finally bought the mill, and then I learned. How'd I learn? I went to the lab, the lab that sold me the mill, and I said, you guys are doing it. I wanna learn how to do it. They said, okay. I went to Seattle and then started to learn how to mill. But before that, I outsourced, right? Because you're in a digital workflow um, the data acquisition, when I, that's why I start off with CAD CAM. The data acquisition is the intro roll scanner or PVS impression. The PVS impression, the lab is gonna have to digitally scan that and you can send to a milling center. Um, well, this digital milling center is not gonna take a PVS impression, but you can get a unit for 29 bucks, uh, 28 bucks, $22, just based on the zirconia. So you start calculating all these things, getting into digital workflow is gonna save you a lot of time and you'll get these crowns back in, within four days. Um, then I was starting to get some quality control issues, so then I decided to buy a mill. So this is gonna be the workflow in my office. Everybody goes through the same workflow to have a workflow. First, they're gonna come in, give them a tour of the office. How many of you guys um, give a tour of the office? So the, the numbers that we hear are, are 5% of offices give, give a tour of the office, which is kind of crazy to me because all of our patients get a tour, it makes, Patients feel like they're at home, and, but really, I'm telling my assistants, um, you come in, you say, oh, here's the restroom. If you invite somebody in, they feel more welcome there. But then it's really, we're showing off all the technology in our office too, and then they say like, this is the office I wanna be at. So we take a Prexion CBCT first. Number two is we take bite wings, photos, exam treatment plan. Then intraoral scanner, if we're gonna design a case um, to design a wax up, Send it to designer, and then you can decide what you want to do from here. You're going to 3D print. So you're going to go through all this workflow. Basically, it's a step-by-step -step process. I'm going through all this workflow, and I take the intraoral scan with the CBCT, and from here, I can decide. Um, based on the script that Hornbrook was saying, the communication with the designer we're going to talk about here instead, we're going to communicate everything to the designer. If I want a wax up, if I want a surgical guide, if I, if I already prepped, Okay, so there's our Prexion CBCT. I didn't start with the CBCT. First office, I had a panel that was in another spot. I had to randomly add the Prexion at the end of the hall. But what's the problem at the end of the hall? The computer wouldn't fit. So the computer is on the left side there. Um, so just because the old, the old one, old panel was in the hallway, but this, this arm would stick out. So we had to randomly stick it at the end of the hall but I had to look for a solution. The solution was, the computer's on the other side. This is it, this is my son. So I just took a photo one time when we were starting him with Healthy Start, but it allows us to manipulate that machine on the other side. You can, there's still a screen, you can still do it, but one of the benefits that, um, why I found the solution to the Prexion, because I can control the computer in the other room. Move it up, down, left, right. Okay, second, bite wings. If you guys don't have, this, I just started using this for my implants. It takes about a thousand images. I've had the, um, the Nomad x-rays and their batteries always go out like two years. I think they do planned obsolescence in those things. I don't know if you guys have had that. that. But this is a, a new one, it's a lot faster. Photos, photos are very important in the digital design process. Um, Hornberger was talking about sometimes the old school model. I, I had this problem too when I had my analog guy. Your model might be canceled like that, the gingiva might be like that 
and they just do it like this. They put the denture plate on there and then adjust it, but they don't know that your model might be canted. So photos are gonna go along the digital design process. Very, very crucial. Um, let's play this here. So I was training them to take the photos. This is the ones they were taking, getting good shots. This one, I told them that it was coming in from an angle. That's not what you want. You come straight like that. Those are angles, but all nice okay. bright shots. Man. Showing this because I have to do a lot, a lot of photo training, but photos, are going to sell your treatment. So a lot of things, we talk about a lot of selling in my courses because it's a lot of pushback. Oh, I'm gonna do this technology. But if you take intraoral photos, intraoral photos in your, um, in your exam, you're gonna do quadrant dentistry. I do a lot of uh, full arch cosmetic veneers cases, do a good amount a month um, along with my fixed hybrids. But we're taking full photos and that allows I tell the patients, we take these photos so you can see exactly what we see, and they see the, those things. So once they start asking about that, there's different methods, like, do you like your smile? What's your goals? And if they start talking about it, oh, I don't like this, if they bring it up first, you know that patient's motivated. So just, um, these are diffusers. I don't know if you guys see Vu Lee online, but I've been testing a lot of these over the years with him, but everything's branding, right? Marketing. So they come in, we have our logo on there, and you're taking the photo, so it's, you know, he's sending these messages that, hey, we got a lot of technology, but they're gonna remember our brand. Um, this is very cool that we use in surgery. Just use this cell phone's gonna be the easiest to get a social media that will light up. I actually brought it in my backpack if anybody wants to see it. It's like a few hundred bucks, but it takes great photos. That first photo, the before and after, was actually taken with this phone. Um, so this is an optional part of the digital planning exercise. And I'll, I'll play it. But I've got this unit, and honestly, I don't use it that much. It's a little overkill, but since I teach digital workflows, I want to know all of the possibilities. But if you take a distorted photo, is why I bring this up. If, you, if I'm right here, and you take a photo like this, and you put that in your design software that we're going to show, this side's going to look bigger, and this side's going to look smaller. Can you guys understand that? So what a 3D um, face scanner would do, we're going to be able to manipulate it and not distort the photos. A 2D photo, what I mean by it is like, if you have to have good photos, that would be key. You can save a lot of money and save a lot of time because honestly, I don't use that this much unless somebody's really canted and I don't want the designer to think that something is off because we're gonna show that we overlay the photos with the intraoral scanner. Okay, and this is my designer. This is the only, I've been working with this designer for a long, long time. He, he showed me a lot of, we've actually invented a, um, some workflows um, over the years, but that's his number if anybody's interested. He's very, very good. He's a little premium at this point now though, to be honest. So does anybody know what an additive wax up is versus a functional wax up? I kind of want to talk about this because this is, I was very, very confused about this, but this is what a digital um, process allows you to do. Like the cases we can plan it a lot better. And I'm adding some things because some of these things I was unclear when I first started out too. I, um, Hornbook's Lesson was very, very good, but a lot of his models were analog. The benefit of a digital workflow is we've gone through the whole workflow process, right? We've got the intraoral scan now, and we've, we've taken good 2D photos, and we send it to designer. And this is going to talk about, you're going to put a lab script. Please design a wax up 5 through 12. What you can get back is, this is going to be an additive wax up. You're going to get two models. The additive wax, this is if you want to plan the case from start to finish and really plan it and get some execution. I'll show some cases here that you see those parts sticking out. Sometimes a tooth might stick out and you're not going to do ortho on it and that's going to allow you to visualize where you got to prep through. Also, if you do a, if you do a, um, a functional wax up, that is after you've prepped the teeth. But if you only have an ideal wax up, which is, which is a functional wax up, some of those teeth might be sticking out and your um, prep guide is not gonna seat correctly. Can you guys visualize that? Those pieces sticking out, it's gonna distort your impression or whatever it is, and you know we're, we're trying to be conservative, so what you're gonna do with this is you're gonna make a little putty matrix or whatever makes you wanna do. The ideal way is to put this on and then prep through it. And then you can prep, prep through the, um, the temporaries and then get a functional wax up. You'll have a putty model and then once Let's play this. Okay, you can see all the ideal wax up is a little bit behind there. It's a little bit recessed and there's some parts sticking out and you can see all that. So once you prep it, 
then you'll use the ideal wax up and then transfer that over. Okay, so two different ways is subtle. The first model allows you to see those things. That's what, that's what a 3D, a, honestly a 3D printer is gonna give you the, just, um, there's cheap, you can get a $400 3D printer, it's what I started with and now I've got more expensive ones to um, deliver my all on fours with accuracy. Honestly, um, my assistants deliver my all on fours actually because it's so accurate. But we have many cases that come in, like my two day course, we're gonna show cases, patient comes in today, it's always like, I've got a wedding to go through this weekend, can you do it? You send it to the designer, the next morning you've got these wax ups already and you deliver the case. I've done countless, countless cases like that because I guess I'm gonna go back and tell you something else. One of the things they tell you in dental school, you might be asking, how do, you, how do I sell these many cases? So that's the whole point, I'm gonna show you this digital dentistry, is because in dental school, you're told to under promise and over deliver. Well, that's okay. If you wanna be a mediocre producer or mid-level producer, but if you want to, and I say that as there's levels to everything, right? Abernathy's at a $7 million level. We're, we're on the way to get there. Um, shoot go have you can never you can never dream too big right so the digital design process and showing all this workflow what I do in my office is I over promise and then I over deliver why can we do that it's because of digital dentistry so it's an investment but for me personally I think it pays many times over so I don't think has anybody ever heard somebody say over promise and then over deliver in dentistry I don't, think I, I don't even think I've heard that in a, um, in a lecture anywhere, but I've heard that in other industries, and so I brought that over to dentistry. So that's what I, these are the things that I said that I just can't go through everything to sell these topics in our two-day course, but I think that digital dentistry should make you money because there's an expense, there definitely is. But using all these things, we're able to do these cases. We're gonna have to skip through all these. This is a good book if you wanna show how to take the photos. Um, basically, you just need a straight on shot, have the pupils and eyes um, horizontal, um, level, and you can't have it canted like that because even if you have a photo like that and they straighten it out, in a 2D world, it still distorts a little bit. Um, because, how do I know that? Because I've taken bad photos and that's why I show that camera that I was training my assistants. I'm taking a long time on this because once you get into a digital design process, you're gonna get, you're gonna cant a photo and your bite's gonna be canted. So this is just showing the lab script. You have to really, really communicate um, with the digital designer. You gotta say what material you want to use because what we're listing here is once you get it back, an Emacs is, gonna, is going to be milled. It has a different cam strategy. The cam is part of the CAD cam. Is, that's the instruction that say how, tells the, the milling turn left, turn right, turn up, turn down, and it gives all the instructions on how to mill that out. Okay, we're gonna skip through all of this, but one of the big things is that um, we talk about scanning the palette. That's very, very crucial when you're doing a digital design process because in a design process world, I can prep all the teeth and not even go through a rescue bite. And this is gonna be a little bit confusing, but if you guys do full mouth, is that when you're changing the vertical, if I prep all the teeth on the upper, now the bite's collapsed. How am I gonna collapse the bite? That's probably the best use of digital dentistry um, that I do, is that I can prep all the teeth and I'm not stopping making a rescue bite for the front to hold the vertical and then take the bite later with the bite registration. Why that is is because digital dentistry, we can stitch all that together. I can do a pre-op scan, erase the teeth, prep it, and now I have the prep and the bite stays there. But if you ever get lost, Always scan the palate, two reasons. When you're getting that wax up and you transfer it, you always wanna scan that palate because when you have your model and you do your putty impression to transfer it to the temporaries, that palate acts as a resting stop. And I've taught a lot of dentists and I've, sometimes I go to offices just to help buddies out and then not, never scanning the palate and then I tell them these reasons why and it's like one, that's a resting stop and two, for digital dentistry, that rugae on the top of the palate, we can stitch that and align the bite if anything goes off. But I know there's some new dentists in there, I didn't really understand that part, but even in the old school where we take that impression, the, the bottom, yeah, there's not many resting stops, so sometimes it can be a little canted when we transfer the temporaries. And if you are a little canted before, if, if the temporaries come out all good from your wax up and you transfer it all, um, the ideal method, adjust the bite and take a new scan. And now you've got all your, um, the ideal method would be 
after the patient's numb, transfer your wax ups, have them come back the next day, adjust the bike, get all your guidances because the best articulator is in the mouth, scan that, and then um, the digital designer can get all your bite adjustments and transfer that to the design um, beyond the scope here. But actually, I also have a digital articulator now, so I actually do zero adjustments on all my cases. So communication is the key in an analog world or the digital design world. Okay, so last part, manufacture in-house, 3D print, or mill. So you've gone through all those workflows from the first, one, two, three, four, five, six, and that, that's the whole process for all of our things. You go through that process, do the exam, and then send to designer. At, at step six, I can say, hey, design a surgical guide or design a wax up. That's why the lab script dictates everything and it's just a workflow. Is anybody confused on that part or anybody lost on the steps we're going through? So digital dentistry is pretty much all of our analog workflows in a digital world. We don't skip that many steps. It's you have to understand the analog steps to be able to do the digital steps. That's one of the kind of um, confusing things that people tell me, but I'm like, man, that's why I've got to under kind of explain like the palate, why you need the palate and why we're not canceling the bites because sometimes we're teaching new doctors that don't do these processes and it kind of clicks for them. I know if you guys know this already, it's good to just kind of um, tie in with the digital workflow process. This is my scanner that I had from 2017. Um, it's given me a lot of good use and it's still um, cranking. Trios is my favorite one, but we use iTero because we're still doing um, Invisalign. Okay. We'll go to this. Okay, so we'll talk about this. I changed it on mine, I didn't change it on yours. I put this at the end. Um, let's go back through this. I'll talk about the scanning strategies if we have time at the end. Okay, Smile Designer. This is DTS Dental Treatment Simulator. What's the price in there? It's like 48 bucks a month. Um, this is one of the reasons how we can um, sell these treatments. The problem, when I say problem, it's very, very easy. My assistants will do a digital design process. If somebody, we take the photos and they say they're interested in it, um, they can design this super, super quick. On the left is ExoCAD design. That's what my designer did. And on the right is what, I, is what our assistants did in like three to five minutes. You take the photo and now we're showing, that this is what, why the photos are important. We import the photo into um, the CAD. The, the software to design it. Why I bring this up is one, it shows on the right side is that photo that's $48 a month. It's very, very quick that assistants can do it, but I didn't communicate, and that's what we got patient accepted, and then I got a wax up back for, to make my temporaries, because the, the downside of this is that I'm saying that it's just for motivation, still need a CAD software, but I'm not gonna use all that design software, and most offices don't, aren't gonna pay for the CAD software in their office, so once you do that, I'm sending to my designer, and then I didn't communicate. I would send this photo in the future and say, hey, this is what the patient accepted, design it like this. Because that, that design that I got back was too manly. I'm communicating, that's the benefit of a digital design process. You get the picture back and you're like, hey, I don't like that, um, round these edges, round these corners, make it a little, and I sent her that. And she's like, I can't read your damn mind, you should have sent that to me in the first place, and it would have been easier. So communication is key. Okay, we'll start getting to some cases here, and I'll go back to intraoral scanning if we have time. How much time do I have now? What time is it? 30 minutes. Okay, surgery or veneers for this case? Raise your hand if you would do surgery to correct this case. Anybody else? Raise your hand if you would um, cosmetically treat this case. So, a lot of you guys wouldn't treat the case at all then. And that's exactly how I was. This is actually my cousin. He was in ortho for four years. You can see his jaws deviated, his eyes aren't even. Um, we'll show them in the pictures. He's got a lot of issues. Um, I, I asked him, did you fall down when you were younger or something? But he was in ortho, this is the best they could give him. He was in a cross spot on one side. He's telling me, Mike, can you do my veneers? I wanna fix my bite, it's making me very uncomfortable. He's a very self-conscious guy. He's actually a dentist now. And I told him for like six months, hell no. You look at his incisal edges, they're milky white. He's got beautiful, beautiful teeth. I said, get surgery. He's like, I'm not getting surgery. So he's, he's in dental school, he's a D4 student. I kept on telling him no, telling him no. Sometimes you gotta tell no because you're not gonna get those teeth. There's no ceramics that are gonna get that teeth and not break. So I tell him no, this is him. 
and you can see his bite. Or the left him like that. He said, they recommend if you want any better, go to surgery. He says, there's no way I'm going through surgery. So I'm still telling him no. Then finally he comes back and says, hey, I really want you to do it because I trust your process, but I found somebody to do in Dallas, but I don't really trust them. I'm gonna do it with or without you. I'm like, shit. <sighs> okay, <laughs> so let's do it then. What do you say at that point? So um, I usually break the contacts, but a dentist, break the contacts, you do a slice prep, your contacts are all in porcelain. It's a lot easier delivery. This, you're gonna have some adjustments probably um, because the lab, the ceramists will tell you they love it when they, they can control the contacts when it's on enamel. You know teeth shift, so there's, um, when you're impression process, but it w went through a lot easier, but I'm just saying that as a dentist, I would wanna be conservative. So these are conservative press my patients. I slice through the preps, you get a lot better retention, temps don't fall off. All these clinical decisions, I won't say the one's right or wrong, but the problem with this is, this is actually, a, when I got my fellowship, an AGD board question was like, it said a trend in dentistry is to do slice prep, so, um, so if you, you get less staining. Then I started thinking about that. I was like, that makes sense. And I started asking my friends, Dr. Lathrop, Colin Lathrop, he was like, hell yeah. Once, after about four to five years, if you do these kind of preps, you're gonna start getting red wine, and you're gonna start getting stained, and the hygienist and the patients hate it. So, one of the things to consider, so that we've got some new dentists here, those are my, my evolution. You can choose either one. There's always pros and cons to everything. So I'm just showing, it's a little bit hard to see on this, this monitor here, but I'm just showing as a, as a digital intraoral scan. Um, what we were shown yesterday is that we're taking a PVS impression and it would go through a lab scanner. Every, every way it would work, I'm just showing you that it's hard to see on there. So we went from before and the ask the after. How did we get there? Everything that I just showed you, you go through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, say, hey, prep the teeth, you got your mock-up. But look at the bottom, that's pressed ceramics. It looks decent, um, but to get that milky white incisal edge is very, very hard for a ceramist, and you get some breakage on there. I've got, I've got some cases like that, but you get so thin on that incisal edge. So that's why I said he's a dental student. I didn't want to do his case, um, but how do you guys think that turned out? Would you do surgery or veneers? To ideally, push him to, push him to surgery, and I did that because I didn't want to touch his case, but I, he tells me all the time I, I love my smile and it gives him so much more confidence. So if I even stop the lecture here, how do we over-promise and over-deliver? Because we do this day in, day out, you've got a digital design process. In the analog world, the, the, the lab guy would fuck this up. Unless you're doing, unless you got your face bow and articulator perfectly right, you can do it. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of skills. You, we're mentioning these very aesthetic dentists. You would do this case by doing a composite mock-up in the mouth. Sometimes those guys are spending an hour, two hours and adjusting all of that in the mouth. That's, that's too much for me. I would invest in the technology, make it easier. The designer is gonna spend an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours designing the case. Gives me back the models. I transfer the models to the um, wax up. That's what you're seeing. You can't see it on this projector there. That I went too deep. Um, just have a pointer. I went a little bit too deep there because that's where you're seeing the depth, the depth cuts there. So I took it out, out a little bit, smoothed it out. But I'm transferring the, the additive or the um, additive wax up to his teeth, prep through that, take it off, pack the cord, took an impression. And then we took the, um, the ideal wax up and transferred it into the mouth. And then that's what we ended up with. Anybody any questions on that? Yes. Add, the additive. The additive wax up is. Be that and then you're put it on there or what they no, so I'm 3D printing that model. So I 3D print that model. That model comes out. That's like a stone model. That's why I'm saying the digital dentistry just gives us so much power. Like I've got so many patients that come in. It's like I've got a. It's always a wedding, and they come in on a Friday. And what, what can you do for me? And so we do that. Sometimes we do the same day. We design it real quick, we 3D print, tell them come back at one o'clock, it's an eight o'clock appointment, and I've done a full, a full mouth cases from one to three, prep them up, scan them up, and they leave with the temps. Um, but I 3D print that model, so it's just like you've got a stone model back in your office or a wax up. And then we put a putty, I prefer putty because it's flexible, um, or whatever method you want to do, I would recommend uh, a putty, and you're transferring, taking that, load it up with the bisacryl, and load it up in his mouth. And yeah, and you prep through that, and you put it on. Sometimes I get lazy and I just visualize it. So 
it's a good question. I'm skipping a lot of these steps because the two-day course talks about it. I'm probably going to run out of time. But like, so you're going to make a clear suck down on the ideal wax up. And then on your preps, you're going to put two holes, one at the gingival third and one at the, um, the middle third. This tooth, because you want to have a millimeter clearance on there if you're doing Emacs or veneers, or half, you want to have, measure half a millimeter for veneers or 0.7, whatever you want to do. And so that clear stent is going to go over your preps, and you can measure if you have enough reduction. And that's you're going to have that on your um, the ideal wax up or the final wax up that the patient already accepted. That makes sense. So the digital workflow plus this is all analog steps. I'm just telling you that. Um, all the analog workflows, but we get it so much faster and we can visualize things. But what I was saying is, if you did this in an analog world, oh man, my, when I first brought in my ceramist, he was fucking up my cases. He was taking the model and then putting that, you know, that denture plate on there and he was aligning it like that. So they were coming back to my case and I was like this, I was like, what the hell? He's like, look, I'm, I'm making it straight for you. I was like, no, not everybody's jaw is like that. So that's why labs tell you, um, do the face bow, but even the face bow moves. I don't, in residency, none of us did a face bow right. It always moved, and we mounted all of our cases in residency. It's how I learned a lot of these processes, but it moves just a little bit. So the digital design process works is you're taking the intraoral scan and the face, and they put that together, and now you have your lip line, your incisal edge position, all of those things put together. Is that making sense? I know this is confusing at first, but hopefully I'm getting better at explaining this. Anybody got any questions? I always have questions, but nobody asks. Dude, that's a good question. That helps you, a lot of these newer docs understand this process. Before and after, we're just camouflaging this case because, like I said, I turned this case down many, many, many times. Okay, so he's in the mili military now. You can't, guys can't see the lines. But look at his eyebrows, pretty straight. Look at his ears. <laughs> I was going crazy trying to take these photos, but the dude was just, just off. I was like, move this way, move this way. And then my wife was like, he's just off, you can't. <laughs> well, you're, you're, you know, he's your cousin, he's got this hard case, you're trying to nail it, and then you get down, it's like, damn, your jaw's this way, your eyes are this way, but you need the eyes um, parallel. That's what we're showing there. You see his ears, they're not a different level, look at his left side of his chin, but this is what I mean. So I'm gonna harp on this case, because it's gonna show, trying this in a digital world, you're gonna go back to that. You're gonna have to, have to do a mock-up in the mouth then take an impression of that, right, to show where you want the ceramics. It's all about communication. So in an analog way, you can do this. You got to be very, very skilled like Dr. Hornbrook, though, and do all that, put the composite mock-up mock -up like Appa. Those, those guys do that. I'm, I'm, just not, I'm just not good enough because I don't do it enough. I use my technology, and I let the designers do the work, and I go on to another case and see another patient. Does that make sense? Okay. So now it's the fun part. I know, Nathan, you told me not to talk about this, but this is what I do day in, day out. And then we had some oral surgeons, and I didn't know the periodontist was leaving, so I added this back in. So we talked about, an, um, if you take a PVS impression, if you have blood there, it's a full arch, right? It's very, we talked about um, Invisalign. Invisalign was sent, has anybody sent a PVS impression to Invisalign? They said it's distorted, take a new one. <laughs> yes, that's the most annoying thing. And then what do you say? Just go ahead, process it, and I'll deal with it. <laughs> um, so, but then sometimes it might not fit, and you're not getting as good accuracy. So that's going to save you a lot of time and money, just not bringing the patient back and having them pissed off. Um, so that can be distorted. So, and PVS impression can be distorted. A scanner, we'll talk about that later if we have time, is that if you overscan a case, less is more in digital dentistry for scanning, right? What a, what a digital intraoral scanner is doing is you ever have an iPhone and it's like a, taking a panoramic image? What is that panoramic image doing? You got to hold your hand still. It's taking images and it's stitching that together. That's in digital dentistry, an intraoral scanner is stitching all of those images together. So there's scan paths to do intraoral scanning. But if you, if you go from here to here to here and you just give the um, intraoral scanner bad information and it's stitching that together, you give garbage in, you're going to get garbage out it can be distorted, and you don't know that crown doesn't fit until you get it back from the lab. So long story short, I think I gotta tell you the story so you can understand it. So the lab that I trained at was in um, 3D Biocad in Seattle. They're actually the lab that Dr. Kois, if you guys have um, seen a Kois deprogrammer, he teaches how to make these deprogrammers when you're doing these, um, these bigger cases. 
but he uses a trio scanner and he's scanning the cases and they send to the lab and everything fits. Then he, then he trains these doctors and they start getting all these cases in and half of them don't fit. And they, the lab tells me, okay, our design software is the same, our milling is the same, what changed? 50% don't fit from COISA students. What changed is they didn't take a full course and harped on the intraoral scanning strategies. I talk about it for like a couple hours in my course because there's just so many errors that I see dentists doing day in and day out. It's just because the technology's new and the reps honestly don't know how to train on all the little things that can go, go wrong. But what changed is the scanning strategy for, that, for the dentist. So if you ever get a crown back, it's 95% of the time your intraoral scan or the impression was off and that's why the, the lab was off. So now we're, we know that the intraoral scanner and the PVS impression can be distorted. This is the only verified impression taking method in all of dentistry. It's not debatable if you ask me. And we're gonna talk about how this works. So back in the 80s, they were using this to measure within 50 microns, that's 0 0.05 millimeters, um, on a big Porsche. They're putting all this technology on there. And so he's been doing this since the 80s, the CEO. And then he, was, he saw a need in um, dentistry where we were making these verification jigs, which we skip now um, for a full arch. I do a full arch, the whole process is three appointments. Impression, I mean consult, get a, get a pre-design if I want, implants, and then you have post-ops of course, and then, then deliver. It's so accurate that my assistants can just screw it in 30 minutes. Like yesterday's case, I sent it to the oral surgeon, delivered in 30 minutes, and I was here. So I got other doctors there, but my assistants take care of, care of all that now because it's so accurate. The bite is all on point, but this is what this is showing. The spatial fit method with this old ring is um, five microns, and with an intraoral scanner, let's play this. So actually, I didn't know that the iMetric 4D is actually the most popular lab scanner there is because it's cheaper in three shape and it's cheaper than uh, the Medit scanners. So worldwide, this is the number one scanner. So you start learning these things when you go into a lab side. It's because of the, the um, how accurate it is and the price. So you know, econ economics, labs have, a, um, labs have way lower margins than us, so they're gonna pick a, pick a device that's super accurate and that costs less. So this is the leader in there. So he's taken this experience of having Point, um, two micron accuracy for labs, and he transferred it and made a machine um, to do the scanning inside the mouth, okay? Which we go to five microns, so that's the history of that, and this is why it works. This is showing that you've got scanning strategies on the intraoral scanner that I talked about, and there's um, the jaw can stretch, and it's very operator dependent. I used to scan all of my cases, all my on fours digitally, and it, um, it always fit for me, but it, we'll have to talk about the reasons why but it's very user dependent. There's some lectures on the circuit that say that um, intraoral scanning doesn't work. It's, it's, not, it's not correct. You've gotta know what you're giving the scanner. Garbage in equals garbage out. So I'll tell you guys now that um, you just, we just don't show it. Like I'll tell you, all my hybrids used to fit when I was intraoral scanning, but there's nobody sees that I might have so you're, we're stitching, right? We talked about stitching. So the trios makes this noise when I'm scanning. It goes tick, 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 tick. So the first pass is the most important. If it goes tick, tick, tick it's making that noise, and it goes tick, tick. Because scan, you're gonna get the most um, inaccuracies from going from the occlusal to the incisal edge in the front. And if you have an itero, they're gonna show you that once you go in the occlusal, and then you go back around, you're gonna do a, a rollover in the front because you go from a big, wide occlusal table to the small incisal edge that's real thin. What assistants want to do, and I'm going on a tangent because we're having this here, but because this is gonna save a lot of people from having uh, missed crowns that are, aren't fitting, is because this, this is what assistants do. They go from this wide occlusal table, and then they go to the palate and only get the backside of the tooth. And then they go, and they go around the buckle, and they ca capture this side. So you have the whole incisal edge that the scanner is having to guess. So that's a bad scan strategy, and the scanner's gonna put it together but now you're relying on the software to stitch that together. So when I say that all, all of my arches fit and, and I scanned it, it's because I gave the, information, the scanner good information. I'm understanding the stitching process. So the first scan pass, it's gotta be And if it stops, I stop, delete, and do it again. Because I want the first pass to be good because it's putting all the information based on that. And if I stopped, and I know that it's gonna have to guess, I don't want any guessing. 
hopefully you guys understand it better um, because trust me, I see it's so many people post videos online and I'm seeing the scan path and I'm like, okay, you might, may or may not fit. The idea is to be predictable and that's what this showing. Intraoral scanning is very user dependent whereas photogrammetry, the assistants can take the scan once it lights up green, it's verified. Okay, so this is showing that intraoral scanner, my scans wouldn't look like that, but um, the photogrammetry is taking the implants in space and then you have to match that with the gum data and so you're still taking an intraoral scan. So just three targets are required for photogrammetry, whereas the intraoral scanner, you're gonna have to go um, at least 180 degrees. So that's what it's showing. So when you're taking an impression, if you have eight implants in the back, I just pan around there and I'll do it real quick. An intraoral scanner, you've got to get um, usually all around so it can stitch together. So this is the difference between the pick where, you know, how much time's left? Because that's not moving. That thing's staying in 15 minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. So it started off as two, two cameras. That wasn't enough. We went to four cameras. Um, and those are the iCam. The iCam. So, so, so just like everything else in dentistry, pick, I, I got the first unit last year in about May, the first updated unit, which is the most robust unit they have. I got the first one in the United States because I was talking to the, um, I was already involved in digital dentistry. I was talking to the CEO and um, we're kind of going through these things. But I'll tell you that most of you guys have probably heard about Pickmore is because they had all these, um, like nobody knows me, right? So like I was going on this trend because I was in the market the same way. So those are the, um, the reference bodies. The pick, if you haven't seen it, it's this big domino scan flag, but the base of it is all plastic. You can see uh, going on to an implant on a multi-unit abutment, if you, if you tighten it too much on a plastic, it's gonna deform and you're gonna lose a little bit of the accuracy. So everything on this system is designed a lot, lot better in my opinion, but most people know pick because they got all the big, big people around the world um, teaching for them. So this is what you do after a surgery, place it on the implants and then you'll use this machine. And this is what also PIC doesn't do. So you can see it's talking about, you can get uh, variations. Um, so this is how I was explained when I was talking to the CEO. He's the one who taught me a lot of these things. And you know, like, like I said back, I learned the labs do these things every day, so I learned that and we bring it to our office. This guy's an engineer, and the funny thing is there's people who debate him online, but he's been doing this stuff since the, the 80s. The PIC system he was telling me is like, if you're in Alaska and it's cold, that, that cable is gonna be a sh a shrunken more. And even when you warm up your, your scanner, those wires, um, once it heats up, it's a little bit different. So he tells me, he, he saw me, I posted a video, I turned it on, and I started scanning. He's like, Mike, you know, ideally, you wanna leave it on because we've tested it to be warmed up for five minutes before. And I'm like, shit, I don't think about those things. But he's an engineer, and he's thinking about all these, these accuracy things. So this is a carbon fiber plate. Carbon fiber is super expensive because it doesn't distort no matter where you're going hot or cold. So all these little things are thought of, whereas the PIC system, uh, you don't, there's no, not even a calibration because that's, that's my problem with Itero, right? Itero doesn't even show you how many image numbers there are. When you take the intraoral scanner, so it's like if you have so many images, it's gonna be hard for that camera to stitch together and you'll notice it, it'll just start scanning slow because it's struggling and then you're adding distortion in there. But their idea is like, oh, we don't wanna show those numbers, dentists don't need to know that. Whereas you have a Trios or a Medit scanner, you're, it's showing you all the images it's taking because it knows more images, the bigger the file, the more stitching, the more errors you can introduce. And see, these are the iCam bodies. It has a titanium layer, we gotta speed up now. So the silver cylinder is which we debated with him. I said, I, I have to sandblast them. Um, but now he's gonna start sending them out. I just got on a conference call with him earlier this week, just seeing what he's developing. I said, why didn't you sandblast them? He was like, oh, FDA didn't want sandblasted bodies. And I was like, but now they're gonna start sandblasting because an intraoral scanner struggles with this. I'll tell you right now, I don't know if I should say this. Um, Trios is gonna be the best intraoral scanner. I don't sell any of these products, but Armin does sell the Medit scanner. <laughs> so I'll tell you guys privately, I posted online that I, I said I'll bet him $50,000 that I can race them because he's always calling me out online that, um, that the Medit is gonna kill the Trios. So I put this and I said, hey, I'm, I scanned this case with a shiny object and then he's, he's just arming being armed. He says, That's, you're so stupid to scan that case. I was like, so you're saying that it can't scan? And he says, yes, you can't scan that case. So then I posted my video that I scanned it with the Trios in like 30 seconds, and I said, yeah, I've actually baited you because the trios can scan this in a bloody field and the medic can't. I've been testing them all. 
Um, so this is the first case I did with this, this scanner. So this patient came from out of town, um, heard about us. This is one of my first cases that I did with this unit a year ago. She comes in, paired, only involved teeth. So you're not going to save them. Same workflow. Got a photo. Patient accepts the treatment. Show them your cases. This is what we can do. Over promise, over deliver. Going back to the same workflow. Give the photo and designer, hey, we're going to do an all on six on the upper. Small design process. This is it, this is what the designers do. But I think a lot of us haven't seen what it is, but it's very, very simple. You take the smile and you take the intraoral scan, it overlays and you design it out. Otherwise, if not, I'm gonna have to be shaving down those teeth because they're super erupted to get the ideal smile line and then you take that, take that impression and send it all the way to the lab but they're waiting. I did this case, she came in and I did it on a Saturday. She came in on a Friday and I did the surgery on a Saturday and got her teeth. Um, I wouldn't recommend all those, but you gotta get your workflows down first. Place the implants, six implants. And this is her, her temple I delivered. And she healed and I didn't even see a post-op on her. I usually want to, she just couldn't make it back. She was older. Um, that was the mill out temp. That was when I was first starting the gum process, but you don't wanna make it look too good. It looks a lot better. Now, we'll skip through that. And this is, I'm, I'm a lot faster now. This was one of my first ones. This was a, a year ago. This was during the pandemic. This is how you take the, um, the skin. It's just panning left and right. So the pick is designed, it's got those big scan flags. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but it's stationary. But we know if you have implants in the back, like pterygoid implants, oh, you're not going to be back. get back there. There's a course recently that they struggled for like an hour to take the, t it was a pterygoid case and they struggled because that's the design there. So that's why we showed the evolution that, hey, that doesn't make any sense. Let's go ahead and pan. But one company says, no, that's technique sensitive. But another company, this company says, well, yeah, but it's a better, you can see more and more objects and you get a better impression on there. Does that make sense to you guys? We're just scanning these impressions right after surgery. There's no, it's very hard to do that. With, you can't take an impression after surgery. This is in a bloody field. Right afterwards, we take the impression, we get this information, they're able to s align this data and design the full arch hybrid and to deliver. That's the surgery, take it out the teeth. I'm just showing the cement on there and that's, that was her final she was given. So, you know, you're gonna have some um, limitations if they don't do the bottom teeth, the things are super erupted, but she should do that and we can change out the design process better, but looks pretty good overall. Oxyvac, this is a random thing that if you guys aren't using this for your, um, I don't make any money off of these things, but if you're doing a lot of surgeries, that this cleans the blood better than any of all this. I was getting my um, lines backed up a lot, but this is probably the best product to have. Okay, so this is. Okay, guys, I'm gonna set this up. I'm gonna. We'll show my metric, then we're gonna evolution of how fast I scan now, and we'll answer some questions because I'm running out of time. So this is the calibration. The argument pick gives is like, oh, well, we don't want to calibrate. It took five seconds, and now you're giving more accuracy to your scanner because in your environment you have it's calibrating the scanner right, right then and there. And that's it. Got That's my verified impression because those you guys can't see it, but all those implants on the top are green. Once they light up green, you're verified. It can be yellow, and yellow can still work depending on many views. That's what I mean by this is the only verified impression taking method um, in all of dentistry. So we don't need to show right, it. Uh, I had to take another video today, because somebody said, oh, you got lucky on the case. I was like, what? I, know. <laughs> I, do, I do this all the time. Like, it's not, it's not luck, it's just... It's, Okay. This is 28 seconds, the whole total video. But people want to see it in action, so I had to start taking that video. See, I don't even have good retraction. She's not even retracting the gums that well, but we're done. It, 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 very, it is, because I, I send the patients home. You can do same day if you want. It's just the patient's sedated. We, so one of the... Um, one of people debate is like, oh, the patients are expecting their teeth. I was like, I don't have anybody pushed back. I said, well, get done with the surgery. You're sedated. You've got to come back either way the next day to adjust your bite. So we'll just go ahead and let you rest, and then we'll bring you back the next day. First thing in the morning, they come in, screw in the teeth. That's it. Okay, somebody asked me at the last course. I don't think we have time to go through this, though. So. Okay. You want to go through this? Okay, so somebody asked me, what if, what if you're opening the bite? Well, this is how you do. So you either do a Lucia jig or a leaf gauge. This is why my course kind of gets confusing to some people. I'm sorry if it, it does, but I'm having to answer all these questions because people are like, how do you do this? So this is how you do it. 
Okay, guys, I'm gonna set this up. I'm gonna know how to go right so now. far back. So you open up the bite. Um, this is after his ortho. Open up the bite. What am I doing? Smile design process. I need to take the photo of where it's opened up, and then I need to take the scan of where it's opened up. It's all, all pretty much all the same. Once you start doing analog, you can do it in digital. Honestly, I started in the digital process, so I didn't even do all these things analog. This is it. This is simple. Go through the whole workflow. Like Sonia was saying, you've got a workflow, you've got the photo, and you just communicate to the designer. It's all the same things, but it's so much easier with the digital design process and the technologies. Then we get this bite there, and this was a unique case because I prepped the whole teeth. We waited for the designs, and those are all single units 3D printed crowns. We have the technology now where 3D printed, doesn't matter how many units you put on the build plate, it's gonna all print at the same time. So I didn't do any adjustments in there, stuck it in, took his bite, and I just did that just, just to show the possibilities, but you've gotta wait for the design and those things. It's, you don't have to be too complicated. I was just showing the process because people were asking. I, I think of these things to do because people are like, hey, can I do this? Yeah, you can do anything, but are you gonna wait for it? I can deliver the attempt the same day, but you've gotta wait for it. So there's benefits to converting, but the conversion takes about two and a half hours. I can get my thing designed and printed in that same amount of time or two hours, or depending on how. So that's what we started. He started off in January. I finished his case in May with ortho and everything. We do Accelerate Orthodontics. It's a whole other lecture. Um, that's the second video of his bite. So we're not, we didn't jump the bite fully. So sometimes you don't jump the bite fully, you're gonna open up the bite and you can do it with the prosthetics. And that's how you get it. So you can do a complicated case with digital dentistry. I know I can do it because of the whole design process I'm teaching you guys. If you guys wanna learn more about it, we'll go more in depth, but it'll tell you that if you overpromise and overdeliver, I guarantee you're gonna sell a lot more cases. Hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. Yeah. I love it.